this was a new subject for me. I had certainly noticed that John Redfern did work and noticed that he had passed away, sadly. But uh, that was really the extent of it until this wonderful idea arose of honoring him in a program preceding our symposium. And the right guy to do this, who seems to have made a life work now out of honoring John Redfern, uh, is here to tell us why uh, he was, was such an important person in the, in the world of horology. Martin Conrad. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name, as you know, is Martin Conradi, and I'm here to talk about John Redfern and the website that we've constructed to celebrate his work. Um, I wonder how many of you collect Ferraris? <laughs> the cars, not the watches. Uh, if you collect Ferraris and someone, perhaps your mother-in-law, ask why you, on earth you spend so much time and money on such a wasteful uh, hobby, you can take her out for a spin on a lovely summer's evening and there's a good chance that she'll start to understand that the experience can really be quite special. And perhaps she'll forgive you a little. Some people collect stamps. My late uncle was a serious stamp collector. After years of searching, he bought at great expense a single stamp to complete a printer's page of what to most people, certainly to me, looked like identical tuppy blues, much superior to Henry Black's. <laughs> when you finally found the missing stamp, he was overjoyed. Of course he was. But then he had to tell his family that in order to pay for it, he had had to cancel the family holiday in France that year. <laughs> it took a little time in a cool, damp English summer for family feelings to settle down again. <laughs> About 20 years. <laughs> so explaining one's passion to others is not always straightforward. In this short talk, I want to tell you about one man's contribution to the art of describing watch and clock movements to help others better understand and perhaps share that passion, or at least sympathize. Now, I'm not a horologist. I'm not an animator. Worse, I'm not even a collector of anything. But I met a man who opened up the world of clocks and watches for me. His name was John Redfern. His business was horology, and he was an animator of genius. In the 90s, 1990s, the Patek Philippe Museum in Geneva uh, commissioned Redfern to make a number of films of their watches and automata, and they very kindly allowed me to put these onto the website. This is the Patek Philippe 215, one of eight films that he made for them. It's an accomplished piece of filmmaking and shows a teacher's touch in the way a complex operation is presented step by step and the point of every sequence is always clear. And I always wonder how many people who've seen this film have tried taking their own watches apart. He <laughs> makes it look awfully easy and very logical, which of course it is. He made it by modelling all the parts of the watch on a computer in great detail so that they appear to work exactly as they do in a real watch. But to be, given, to be convincing, other things are also important. The colours and shading and textures of the different materials matter. The lighting and shadows and reflections need to be realistic. And the way things move and interact get up to speed or slow down, must all be appropriate. Then, when this cast of objects assembled, he can do what any film director does, organise his actors to do as he demands to tell a story. Animation of timepieces is as much about storytelling as Mickey Mouse or Wallace and Gromit. The film goes on to illustrate the powertrain, followed by the escapement and balance, and finally here, the 
the winding mechanism. Pass on the winding mechanism, yeah. and this is best in tonight. If anyone um, has any questions at this stage, <laughs> which are the early stage, I'd be happy to um, either answer them or pass them on to my colleague, Dan. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I started this, this project um, a couple of years ago when I learned that uh, John Redfern had died. Um, I only met John Redfern a couple of times. Uh, but I was very interested in animation. I ran a small computer graphics business. And the sort of animation he was doing was something that I would love to get my, or would have loved to get my clients to work on, to work with. Um, my clients mostly were financial, um, financial institutions, uh, and they usually gave me 24 hours to produce a 100 slide deck. <laughs> um, and the opportunity for um, uh, using John was um, uh, limited, so, mm -hmm. so I never worked with him. We stayed in touch for years, um, uh, usually phone calls to and from Scotland. Um, and I liked him; he was an enormously likable man. Um, and uh, he was always somebody there in the background who one day I'd be able to use, but sadly it wasn't to be. But uh, a lovely man, and uh, several of my colleagues here knew him much better than I did, um, and uh, have been very helpful in helping me put the, the, the website together. and then corrects the minute hand. Um, something we all do at times, a nice little visual joke. So there's the two one five hopefully going back together again. Um, and you can find the full film of all the sections on the website. Um, so how's it done? If you want to model something as complex as a watch or clock, uh, your first step is a CAD file computer-aided design. The Disney hand-drawn set approach 
just won't cut it, and Wallace and Gromit is not. Uh, for real control and real quality, you need a CAD file. And I looked everywhere on the internet for a decent CAD file, and that's the only one I could watch uh, that I could find, which I don't understand at all. Um, CAD gives you, this is 2D, CAD gives you a 3D world on your computer screen, where you can model things accurately and position them, position them just where you want them, and then animate them. Almost all modern watches are designed using CAD. But the 215 was introduced in 1974 and there was no CAD file. So Redfin would probably have built the file from the detailed production drawings. This wouldn't have bothered him one bit. Uh, he was a serious horologist. And even if a CAD file already existed, it was the functionality that interested him. Here's the Frodsham uh, double impulse chronometer wristwatch, an example of which is being worn down here on the front. Um, they launched this in 2018. Uh, it's based on George Daniel's double impulse escapement, and uh, which has uh, two escape wheels, each completely independent of the other, each with its own mainspring and train. This little clip shows the escapement in action. It's from one of Redfern's very last films. You can see that he's made it plainer and simpler than the 215, despite having more powerful computers, better software, and a lot more colours. He knew that if you wanted to explain a complicated movement, sometimes simplicity is better, and all those carefully crafted colours and shadows and reflections simply get in the way. Instead, he highlights what he wants you to look at and focus on, and lowlights everything else. It's a very good technique. Um, the white text and the white circles draw your eye, and with what he called his power arrow, short coming up there, mm -hmm. uh, as a shortcut to showing where an impulse is applied, you can't help but follow the logical steps he creates. This arrow and the black backgrounds were his signature style. All the videos I'm showing up are on the website, johnredfern.com, sorry, redfernanimations.com, um, and I've picked just a few uh, short examples to hopefully whet your appetite. There are 24 films, each with a story to tell, uh, including, um, but sadly some of his work has been lost including one of the Parthenon in Athens, visually, visually rectangular, but built out of complex curves. I'm told it once featured in the Nashville Parthenon replica, but I'm still trying to track it down. Any of you know anything about any of that? I would be delighted to hear. Um, Redfern uses file copies to test ideas and trial new software. So there's often no final version of a particular animation. He was like an artist, not a businessman, uh, an artist, a painter who overpaints his early work uh, as he get, develops his talents. John was the uh, son of a vicar. He was born in the English Midlands um, in 1939. He left school at 16 with no qualification, no, no special qualifications got his own or whatever it was at the time. Um, but he did have an abiding interest in everything mechanical. He, uh, he, bought, he borrowed five pounds from his mum to buy his first car and stripped the engine down in his bedroom. <laughs> Quite well, what his mother thought of that is not recorded. Um, John never lost his love of cars. The faster the better. He shared that with George Daniels. He once ran a derelict 1955 uh, Ferrari 250 GT in France in a shed and bought it and restored it to its full glory. So he would have been uh, well in tune with all you Ferrari collectors. <laughs> he started his creative life in the 50s, in 1950s, as a film editor, working on a range of films, including the English release of Spartacus. Like his cars, his love of film never left. 
In the early 70s, he had become fascinated by clocks and started taking them to pieces to learn about them. And this, as in almost everything he did, he was self-taught. Clocks and watches quickly became an obsession. Uh, and uh, sorry, losing my place here. Um, so naturally, he started his own clock restoration business, which prospered. By the late 1980s, he confidently called himself a clock watch and chronometer maker. His restoration work was meticulous and he had clients on both sides of the Atlantic. With a successful business uh, and contented home life, most people in middle age would have settled down to reap the benefits, but not John Redford. By the early uh, 1990s, it was Redford animation. Now think about that, that's a big jump. So how did it happen? Well, back in the 1980s, Redfern had started lecturing on clocks and clock making. His early slides were fairly conventional, technical, colourful, maybe, but on the whole, conventional. Wanting to make them more interesting, he tried his hand at computer-based drawing. And up to that time, he'd never touched a computer. He said that the day that he found that computers would allow him to draw a single tooth and array it around a circle to form a cogwheel, changed his life. And so it proved. He became frustrated that drawings, photos, and even videos of timepieces could never capture the fundamentals of the working movement. So he started to experiment with animation. He was nearing 50 when he started on this whole new and highly technical career. And this was doubly brave because there was no known market what he wanted to do. Illustrations of uh, videos and clock and watch movements were common enough, but you could only show how some parts worked by stopping them. They were too small, or too quick, or too hidden. Redfern realised that if you could use animation to get inside a working movement and slow it down, a whole range of possibilities would open up. That was a key insight, and he was convinced that there must be a market for this. But no one had ever attempted this sort of animation before, so typically he taught himself. Bringing together all his skills as a horologist, teacher, film editor, and by now, computer buff, and he was very good on computers. His goal was to take the viewer into the beating heart of a timepiece and make the experience even better than the real thing. Today, films of watch and clock movements, including animation, are commonplace. Indeed, the NAWCC has an extensive li library of instructional videos. Um, So, yes, the NAWCC has a big library of this. Um, and the internet, too. And the internet has, a, uh, has some excellent and many designs to teach and illustrate, just as Redfern's are. But I think Redfern brings artistry and focus and a huge sense of love and respect to his films in a way that a few others have achieved. They have character. If you need a CAD file before, to, before starting any serious animation, what about Redfern's great love, historic timepieces? Well, for that you have to make the CAD file from scratch. Ideally, you need the watch. Not a small thing when you're talking about Harrison's age four. Then you need to take it apart, understand it, measure it, and create the file. Or at least work with someone who has already done much of this background work. 
A long case clock with an anchor escapement is one thing, but the much green is quite another. But sometimes there are shortcuts, perhaps detailed drawings and descriptions that can help, and photogrammetry can measure parts quickly and accurately. Then you model the timepiece in your computer to create the CAD file, decide what story to tell and how to tell it, create and edit the animation, and render it out to video. Sounds simple, but it can take months and months of work. The Rocha singing bird pistol in the Fatek Museum has some 500 parts and a small but very impressive bird. <laughs> Redford had to measure and document each part individually. Despite help from the museum staff, this fascinating film took him 2,000 hours from start to finish. That's a whole year's work. The film is on the website and well worth watching, and hopefully does that first thing. Time is always money, and so were resource museums and collectors were, were Redfern's main clients. He created uh, several animations of Harrison's timepieces. Uh, this early short animation of the grasshopper escapement shows uh, how even with basic software and a limited color palette, you do already feel part of the action. So this was clearly an improvement over pictures, but as far as Redford was concerned, it was only the start. He wanted to find a way of getting video to mix seamlessly uh, with the computer graphics. Meanwhile, um, Redford's work was beginning to get noticed, starting to make waves, just as there was a surge of interest in Harrison. And at around that time, a young man in the Maritime Museum, one of Jonathan Betts on the left of the picture, and sitting here at the front, uh, commissioned Redfern to make an animation of H1. Redfern stopped by to show me this. Uh, it was groundbreaking at the time, and frankly, I was hooked. In these clips, you're looking not just at the history of animation, but also at the history of computers. Remember VGA, the 386 chip, 640 by 480 resolution, 256 colors, it's all there. And the start of a slow climb uh, to the speed and colors uh, and resolution to give us the photorealism that we all now take for granted. As you can see, the, the linkage between the balances is very low resolution. And, uh, so he wanted to improve on that, and this is a, a later version, um, where he was able to marry simple video to match his computer modeling, and had better colors and resolution to play with. The position of the camera in each sequence is fixed. There was no way to move it if you wanted to harmonize with the computer graphics. But it's already a big improvement, which I hope you'll agree. You may have noticed his logo, you can barely see it on there, and copyright notice. Uh, in 2016, he was persuaded to put these on much of his earlier work to protect it. Uh, so 2016 does not mean that that was done in 2016. It were also to indicate it was unfinished and hadn't been released to clients. Now to Harrison's H4. So I keep having to check it's working. Um, Anthony Randall was planning a lecture on H4 for the Longitude Symposium and commissioned Redfern to, to provide this explanatory film from uh, Randall's own notes and observations. They work closely together on the project, uh, and you can see a big jump in quality in both software uh, and the uh, as both the software and the computers improved. Many in the audience said afterwards that it was the first time they could really see and understand this complex timepiece. And even the Horological Journal was quite impressed. 
In uh, 2008, Redfern built one of the very first professional level digital video cameras. It was another big jump. Nobody really knew what such a camera could do or how useful it might be. So as ever, he worked it out for himself. But more than that, it was also a very expensive gamble. The camera needed mo a motion control unit. That's big bucks. A specialized support, vibration-free rig, which he built himself on the cheap. Uh, and much else besides. Here's just a short bit of his test video. The results astonished him. Firstly, he found that the quality and accuracy were exceptional. He could now put a movie screen with an area just a quarter of an inch or five millimeters wide. Then with computerized motion control equipment, the camera no longer needed to be fixed. He could move it smoothly and accurately. But the real breakthrough was that the animation software and the camera and the motion control equipment could all talk to each other. Setting the parameters in one, they could be instantly communicated to the others, allowing the paths and timing set in the animation to be exactly replicated by the camera. Equally, the camera's lens qualities, uh, such as exposure, perspective and depth of field, could be reflected in the animation. This is what he'd been chasing for over 20 years, the ability to combine high quality filming with cutting edge computer graphics. Sadly, John Redfern died in 2019, at the age of 80, still working. His legacy is a pioneering body of work that will inspire future animators and help enough help open up the wonders of the horology to a wider public. So if you need to convince your mother-in-law or a rich uncle of the value of collecting watches, <laughs> this final film might help. The voice you'll hear is John Redfern's, so I'll leave him to have the last word. Thank you. to the statement in a moment, but this watch has a beautiful and rare balance spring, the Duo Inuno, a combination of helix and spiral, designed to fit a longer spring into a thinner movement.
This isn't intended as a full explanation of the spring desert escapement, but rather to show some of the methods that can be used to explain and illuminate. For complex technical explanations, a plainer, simpler rendering can sometimes provide a clearer look. This is the very heart of the action. As the balance unlocks the escape wheel to release the train, the balance is then given an impulse by the escape wheel. Using our sophisticated camera motion control system, we can film the reassembly of the watch on the move. Thank you very much indeed, Martin, for that amazing excursion through the life and work of, of John Bentham. And if, those, if there are those in the room who hadn't seen anything before, I think you will probably be pretty amazed. Um, and that website, as Martin says, has, has everything there, and they're, they're quite wonderful. The plan now is to um, have a bit of a session in which um, a, a few of us will uh, get together. I, I guess we're going to do that up, up here, so we'll have a bit of a panel discussion. But I think it's an opportunity for the, the room to get engaged as well, because probably there are some questions um, that arise from what you, you've seen and you've heard. So feel free um, to, to pose those questions. Uh, and perhaps if I could ask Will Andrew is to join me up here, yeah? Is that what we're going to do? And Martin, are we going to come up to the centre? We'll share this one. So, um, and immediately the floor is off. Okay, so the fortunate has a, has a question. So, please go ahead. I consider myself reasonably well read uh, <laughs> uh, in the horological publication. And, you know, I know that these things have now been computerized and things. But up to today, up to half an hour ago, I was not aware that these tools in that depth and quality are ex even are even exist. Why is that? In case anybody didn't hear 
Fortuna, he's basically posing the question, why is it only today that he's become aware of this and perhaps why isn't there greater knowledge of the depth and quality of, uh, of horological animation? Um, who wants to, to chip in on, on that? Martin, do you want to go up? You're, you're all looking at me, I <laughs> try, try and answer it. Um, a lot of these animations were held by museums so unless you went to the museum, you wouldn't see them. Um, since his death, uh, the museums have, the museums I've spoken to, have been more relaxed and have allowed us to uh, assemble all these things onto, into one place on a website honoring John Redfern. So although if you knew where to look before, you would have found them. Um, they weren't well known. They were known fairly well to people who interacted in his sort of a world of virology, um, but they weren't generally well known. Now they're all available and we hope they'll become much better known um, and will particularly encourage art schools and um, uh, places like that to see the potential of this sort of animation work. If I can offer a comment as well, um, to give you the, the, the experience from hosting him as a lecturer, mm -hmm. which I explained was quite hard going. Um, we received the files in advance, we had to test them, we had to make sure that everything would work. But the number of times that we had to commit never to sharing the files and never to show them outside the context in which they're going to be shown was yeah, many, many times. And indeed, the animations of the Nib clocks at St Andrews were after his death for a while somewhat lost. You know, there was a you know, well, where are they? Well, it turned out. Well, we did. We still have the ones that we had been sent, so that's where they came from for the site. Um, I think you could probably understand that. For the AHS. Yeah. The um, as as Martin says, many of them work. Um, these were works commissioned by and therefore paid for by people who then wanted to guard the intellectual property involved. So there was an understanding that they wouldn't be shared, they would be used in specific settings, like on a screen next to an object in a museum. And we're now in a different phase where perhaps there's a realisation that, okay, if the animator has gone, is it justified to bring together a body of their work? And everybody is in fact very pleasingly agreeing to that. And, uh, the site will become better known. So I think that's, that's the answer to the question. Um, will has it? Well, I, I, I wanted to say a couple of things. One, none of this could have happened without Martin. He has done a most outstanding job to pull this together. Philip White, who can't be here, Richard Stenning, were very much involved at the beginning, Jonathan too. Um, and this, is, this has been a very important development. The museum world has changed as well, because you may remember years ago you could go into a museum but you could not take pictures. Mm -hmm. Pictures were forbidden. The whole digital world of uh, iPhones and everything has transformed all that. And so the dissemination of knowledge has changed uh, also. Um, John, too, was extremely worried about intellectual property because it's so easy for people to copy and he can't make anything of it. And, you know, he had a struggle with at least one of his clients about intellectual property. So, um, you know, being a sort of pioneer in the field, that was a very difficult question for him. If he gave away all this wonderful work, you know, how does he go on doing it? He has to have patrons. Jonathan was one of the first ones for the National Maritime Museum, and I'm ever grateful because it's in the Rolovichite Symposium. Anthony had his film, which he paid for, Anthony Randall, but Jonathan allowed me to use uh, some of the H1, John Redfern's drawings. So is there another question? I've got? I thought there were lots of time. Yes. Yeah, I have a, for people who aren't in the AHS, there's an interesting and rather nasty controversy going on about the horological illustration of Huygens. Is anybody interested in seeing if they can resolve it by animation and cat tech? That's a good question. Um, it's been pointed out by obviously a member who reads the AHS journal that there is currently um, what we call on the inside the Anglo-Dutch wars, 
uh, <laughs> an argument over, uh, as ever, um, over Haugen's and uh, and Horowitz will instruct on the, the emergence of the pendulum clock. Uh, and the nice notion being presented on the floor here that perhaps um, our, our communicants should stop writing letters and commission animators. It's a very good suggestion which our editor will, I'm sure, be very pleased to put to them. Um, it will pose, though, the question which perhaps I'm going to put on behalf of all of you, uh, perhaps to Martin or to, or to anyone else here. So who, to whom would they go uh, if this were to be asked? Who is the successor to John Redfern? Is there one already, or is there? So there's a the horrible shaking of the head going on. I, I do have a thought. There's a book that's in French, Crater Horology, which is this massive poem in French. Got lots of pictures, which is how I thought. But it's basically a textbook that's used to teach French horologic, teach horological engineers how to design watches. And it comes with a CD of MATCAD programs to, to do this. Okay, stuff. so the observation there is that the, the trait of horology, which is used to train French uh, watch engineers, is heavily illustrated and does indeed come with a CD of CAD CAM drawers and so forth. So that maybe, okay, so it's uh, a, a new emergent animator might. Choose to cut their teeth on, on such a thing, John. Um, there, there is, in fact, an N2S Steen student who's now working on animation, and he has an Instagram site, Vector, I think it is, and his name is Senior Moment. Um, a few years ago. Elliot Collage. Elliot Collage, exactly. Collage. Collage, Collage yeah. I think, isn't it? Yes, that's right, Elliot Collage. Yes, there, yeah. there is, indeed. I, so there is somebody working on it. I should have thought of him earlier, yes. Yeah. Just quickly getting back to the previous question, uh, one of, I think one of the reasons that uh, Red Fern's animations were not widely known was um, they say that the best looks easy, and um, Martin has alluded to the number of hours that were put into this, but I don't think anyone quite appreciated how long it took John to get these things rendered properly and fully. And the consequence of that is they were eye-wateringly expensive. They were hugely expensive, and of course that limits the number of people who can actually afford them. Uh, and that's really the reason why it ended up being the Patek Philippe Museum and just one or two others, and having paid so much for them, and that's not a criticism, John, he earned every penny of it, but they were that expensive, and they need to be seen in that context. That's, I think, why people were reluctant to just let everyone have them because they paid so darn much for them. I think it's a question here, here yeah. first, Tom. When, when John first published the Redford Animation website, I recall having seen his animation at the Longitude Symposium, and in it, he had false color added uh, for the friction in some of the interactions of the parts, and he had not put that in the lace book. So anyway, I contacted him and asked him about that and to see if we could get some lace with that. And he was tentatively interested in, in putting the rest of the physics, if you will, into the animations also. And I think that this is just an incredible opportunity for some organization uh, to take this forward because this is the only way we can make these things understood. I, I don't think it's possible to teach it. So the rest of the floor there, I mean, is the, the, the comment being that that you, there are examples in his body of work where you can see the tools that can be used to explain the physics much better. It's those things like adding the power arrows, for example. Um, there, there could be a lot of uh, educational uh, eff, um, success in, in, in doing some of that. So, um, he used false color in the one he did for John. <laughs> he did. There were little kind of um, uh, red, uh, by red from new flashes, which were friction. And it was, it was, yeah, it, it was a good thing to do. But I, are you suggesting, Tom, that, that we should take Red Fern's animations and go forward with them? I wonder how, how people would feel no. about that. Martin, would you, do you kind of feel that Red Fern's animations are sacrosanct and that perhaps we should start afresh using his technology and do something else rather than, than take his beautiful work and alter it? I think his, his beautiful work is a world treasure. Yeah. yeah, but it's also too far. Too far. Oh, something much, much greater too. But this is all part of the sort of development of civilization. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Bob and I were talking about for a while was how do we promote this this event? Who else should be coming here? And we were thinking of art schools, um, 
there are, there are a few in this area. And I think that, you know, the moment they start seeing the quality of these animations, this is a wonderful project for them to have. And you might just find one or two students who really catch on to this. So I would hope we can promote them. We need to, we need to take a question from over here. This is leaving and, and you're leading into a kind of a, a question area that I had because clearly in the younger generations, uh, gaming online, uh, is tremendously popular. It's a massive industry, and it's uh, very technologically well advanced. But I don't know of anybody that's actually taking, you know, for this kind of purpose, the artistry, the the talent, the animation, the video, the merging of all of those together, the just the brilliant ability to deploy those. And it kind of feels to me like even today, with all of that. Uh, schooling going on for people doing animation, that it's still, is it really beyond the pale of so what the people can do today? The, 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 from, from the floor, the, the suggestion is that the, uh, the, we know the world, a very important world of gaming, where clearly the technology is highly advanced, there's an immense amount of money thrown into a lot of skill, it's something amazing important to young people. Is that a world in which there could perhaps be a crossover and uh, should effort be deployed there, uh, which I think is. You kind of have most of the room agreeing with you that uh, it's interesting to explore. Um, Just this a comment, a source of that talent, mechanical engineers, yeah. uh, and in particular, there's a form of mechanical engineering it's called normal mode analysis. Yeah. And what they do is they look at how an assembly vibrates when it's subjected to pressure. And they make animations that look a lot like this in one part, but they're trying to find out at what frequency this thing sinks. And they are so close to what we are doing. So the, the comment there is that um, in the, the world of mechanical engineering, normal mode analysis is already uh, succeeding in demonstrating um, the way that you know, machines you know, can, can be shown when you know, how vibration patterns are visible. That there is already a very good replication between uh, real world and the modeling that's done of it. So there, there's, there's a close comparison there. Yes, indeed, Bob. Um, I, I first saw uh, John Richards animations in America here, I forget what the year was, but it was at a conference in Cleveland, and I think it was the first time his animations ever were seen by Americans. And I looked at that material, even in its, somewhat in its infancy, and I said, this is the most remarkable stuff I've ever seen. And I look at it a little differently now. I look at it as the savior of virology because we're always wondering how are we going to get young people involved in this field? And there it is, right there. So another encomium for John from the floor there in that you know, the quality of animation that he achieved is surely a way to, uh, to tap into the minds of, uh, of the prospective new young horologists that we hope will be interested. Um, you know, this visual tool is, is one of the things that perhaps may attract the community of people that otherwise might not there's a hand up there. Do you know what particular CAD system he was using? Do we? The question just there was, do we know what CAD system he was using? He started on Autodesk when I think it was just Auto, Autodesk CAD and <coughs> with um, uh, 3DS Max, I think, by the time he finished, by the, the time he died. The, uh, the red camera or what? The red oh, camera. Red something or it, would, it was a, the first one was the red. And then the second one he got, because he liked the first one so much he couldn't resist the second one, uh, was the epic. Oh. And those are still being made, I don't Some know. I, I don't know. But there's some information about it on the website. So it's another question from the back there. Challenging question there. How can the NHS or the NWCC or any of our organisations manage to incorporate animation in, 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 in what they do? Uh, I mean, I think probably we're stopped from doing that by budgets because, as Jonathan said, the work is eye wateringly expensive. And I was pleading poverty earlier and saying that all the societies are struggling to do what they already do. Um, 
it would be lovely to think that, I mean, and maybe accidentally on occasion, it would be possible. I mean, we already, at a low level, do this in the sense that you will all know that YouTube so frequently now has an interesting example of something, and it is so useful to look at the moving object rather than the static one. And therefore, increasingly, authors in, in their articles, wherever they publish, may choose to let you know, you know, if you want to see this in action, you know, watch this film on YouTube. That is, of course, normally just you know, a simple video representation of something. It's a good step. What Adding animation is an enormous step. The, uh, if you read your Harry Potter, you will know that these things are actually going to come fairly soon, this animation <laughs> on the printed Sorry. page. But uh, if you were to put a link on the AHS website in some appropriate place. Yes, I think, um, I, mean, we're all, you know, I think we're all encouraged, wherever we have influence over websites, to provide a link to the Redford animation one. That's worth doing, without doubt. There's a question here. I, um, I, I spent my, my career in the office where CAD is used not only to design the automobile, it is used to repair and, and it is used to restore. Because that generation of CAD is protected for a certain period of time while the automobile is new, it goes into repair and it goes into restore. What's the conversation with the manufacturers of these current watches that they will start using CAD as their basic, and it, it becomes as a, a current book. It, it, we don't have to, we don't have to uh, expose the, the, the new people. They already use it in everything they do. Yeah. Okay. The, the question is, is about watch companies using animations to um, promote their wares, and I think it's already been done. Um, and successfully, very successfully, Patek shuddered at the cost of John Redfern's <laughs> animations. But we've come a long way from that now. Yeah. His were very early days. And the techniques are improving all the time, so the cost is coming down. I think for anyone trying to sell uh, an object that works in some way, this kind of animation is extremely helpful. This will, you know, everyone wants to know how something works. And there's nothing better than the animation to be able to illustrate that. And the, the other thing I'd say is that compared to a marketing budget, an animation budget is really quite small. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you um, who are uh, Clockmakers Company members might recall that last year, Mark Levy, the master then, um, had a, an outing that it was just virtual, but he had um, representatives, representatives from Jeje Le Couch, um, who indeed did exactly as you say, well, they presented an extraordinary new caliber, um, I think I recall this rightly, um, you know, partly by showing people videos, hands, tweezers, um, but they also had a, 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 an animation, it was astonishing. But they, they were approaching that very much from the point of view of showing off, almost Harry Potter-like, the magic of their machine. I'm sure, I'm not, I'm not yet sure that they are thinking forwards to the time when a similar animation would be used by somebody on the bench dismantling the watch as a guide. Um, but it's a very good point that anything you create to explain it in the first place, surely, absolutely, um, then it could be used to help explain or to guide somebody who's actually working on the object. So it's a nice point um, that came from the automotive industry there. Another, any other? Oh, right at the back. Uh, did John So, uh, obvious question, did John preserve his own archive? Was he aware of the importance of things? Did he, did he keep his affairs in order? Um, yes, is the answer. Um, just uh, hundreds of DVDs, and um, the family aren't prepared at the moment to release them. I think things are still a bit raw. And, uh, but in due course, I'm hoping that um, they will be properly preserved. As a medium of publication, I, I know that not many people are very, very fond of forums. But forums are a natural medium of publication for something like this, because people gather there to discuss as we're discussing right now. And someone can answer with an animation or with an in-depth discussion 
of some delicate point of chronometry. And it's, it, it seems to fit with the intellectual environment. So the, the comment there being that, um, yeah, that there is a view that you know, forums are a wonderful place for the uh, posing of and answering of questions, and that there could be plenty of occasions where you know, the answer can be in the form of an animation, because it's, it's going to be succinct and to the point and give a proper answer. Um, yeah, a, a good point. If one had the arsenal and armory of all of the uh, educational and, um, animations, then had that. Yeah, Indeed, um, it's been suggested that we might just sort of share um, some observations just up here on, um, on, 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 on the man himself and how he was perceived by, by us. So Jonathan, yeah. feel free to kick off. I don't know whether, whether Martin's um, uh, introduction has given you a flavour of, of who John Redburn was. Um, I think you've already realised he was a very remarkable man indeed. He was a very big man, I don't know if you've got that. He was hugely tall, obviously six foot three or something. And when he came into a room, he had real presence. Um, some would say arrogance, but I wouldn't. I'd say it's just a, a real presence. Somebody said, did, did he know what he was worth? Oh yes, he definitely knew what he was worth. He was multi-talented. He, he flew aircraft too, yeah. didn't he? he had, I believe he had his own plane at one point. Yeah. Um, and he was the kind of man that, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a, a storm up there, and he, if he was at the controls, you wouldn't worry because he was totally unflappable, um, especially when he was at meetings, when he was asking for hundreds of thousands of pounds and everyone else was having nervous breakdowns. He would just keep on steadily. Um, he, was a very, he was a very hard um, businessman, uh, but fair, as they say. He was, he was not asking for anything more than he deserved, but very tough when it came to, to business. And as Martin has said, everything had to be just right. And if, if somebody promised him that you know, the, uh, the arrangements would be so and they weren't, then, then he would not be happy and he would make it very clear. So he was no pushover, he, um, but um, a, a, an impressive man and you always, one always felt it was a privilege to, to know him. Didn't you say? Oh, it, was, it was wonderful. I met him in the, when I was at the Time Museum and um, we had a correspondence about a highly regulator um, which needed a new escapement, and he, it was, this was before animation, his work in animation, and uh, he was very, very detailed, um, and, and would keep up a long correspondence about it. Uh, he, he was just a, a pleasure to know, because he was very serious about horology, and made you realize that right at the start. I think it's hard, the hardest problem um, was time because it took so long to do these things and it was so expensive because his standards were so high. Um, things would often take longer than he thought they would. And then he had to go back to the client maybe and say, you know, I don't have enough of this. And that would, that would cause some, some challenges, let's say. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at the result of what he's left us, it's, um, it's a sort of uh, genesis of a new era, perhaps, in, uh, in our education. Thank you. Mm, yes, please. Um, one thing I could add to that is that uh, I was having a conversation with a young animator, um, and John wasn't at all proud of his animation skills. If there's something he didn't know how to do, he would ring around or email around and find somebody who did know how to do it, pick their brains, and then practice it and then use it. And he was quite unashamed about that. But he never knew how good he was, in a funny way. And he was invited to, um, to one of the big uh, conferences that Autodesk um, ran in Europe. And on the side, he had laptop with him and he showed one or two people uh, some of the work he'd done and they all said but that's extraordinary it's not meant to do that <laughs> and so the next year he was invited back as a main speaker and then he became a beta tester for Autodesk he had a lot of trouble with springs because Autodesk couldn't work out or hadn't bothered at that time to work out 
how to animate a spring, how to how it changes as it uh, as, uh, as it uh, as it compresses or decompresses. And um, so they wrote his early work. If you look at the H3, I think um, the spring on that is hand animated, segment by segment. It was that particular that it had to look right. And there wasn't an algorithm for doing the whole spring, so he did it bit by bit. But eventually they produced a, a, a spring module for him, and that's now built in. So uh, he, did, he did the world of engineering great service there. So I, I, I sense that what you've heard over the last hour and a half or so has, I, I hope, given you a wonderful overview and an insight into an extraordinary person. Um, who, uh, whom we've now lost, but who has left us a, a very remarkable body of work um, that is now being curated and, and, uh, and made available. So, um, you know, do go away and look at that. Um, there's a question coming in from Bob. I'm just wondering if he actually could draw as well. Oh. Yeah. Do we know whether he had any draftsman skills? Uh, yeah, I've seen some of his drawings. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he, he um, for freehand drawings, yes, I, I haven't seen uh, um, the technical drawings, but um, yeah, he was, he was a good artist too. Okay. And incidentally, um, uh, did we say that he was a, a very good restorer of clocks as well? I'm not sure we actually pointed that out, did we? Well, we were talking about the heart. Yeah, he yeah, restored one of the escapers. He, he did, escaper. he did. I, I first met John after we left college in uh, 74. My dear friend Peter Watkinson, who was with me then, went to work for John in Devon in 74, 75. He didn't last long because John said he wasn't good enough, <laughs> wasn't productive enough. Um, but I went down to see uh, Peter there and I met John Redburn and uh, he made an immense impression immediately, as you can imagine. He looked down his nose at me and said, you know, a, a snotty student, who, who do you think you are, sort of thing. But it was um, kindly in a way. And he, um, he showed me what he was doing. And he had just made a spring detent for the first time for a chronometer. And although it was um, certainly not something that Daniels or Randall would have made, it was a first attempt. And my goodness, it was good for a first attempt. I could never have managed that at that time. So I made a mental note then, this is someone we're going to hear, hear more about. Yeah. And um, subsequently, yeah, it's more than just uh, uh, the Hardy. I think there were a lot of yes. clocks he worked on over the years. He would restore repeating work and so on. So. He's, he's one of us in the sense of a clockmaker as well as an animator. Mm -hmm. Jean. Yeah. Speaking of um, Peter, your friend, did he have assistants? Did he have apprentices? So, simple question there did, did John have uh, assistants and apprentices? Uh, I, I think he was quite difficult to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can imagine that uh, from what you've heard. Um, Peter went to work with him. In, to say in, in 70, 74, 5, and there was another guy there whose name I never really knew, and neither of them lasted very long. And I don't think John ever took on apprentices after that. I don't think so. Um, unless you know, do you have any others? Yeah, I think he. I think he is to standards are just so high, and you know, straight from college, you're on a learning curve, and he wasn't prepared to tolerate that. Mm -hmm. So um, he could, he just did it himself instead. I think we'll probably draw things to a close now. Um, so thank you uh, very much for engaging with all of those fascinating questions. Um, but also thanks to my fellow panelists for their uh, contributions and insights and, and recollections of, uh, as I was beginning to sum up just now, a remarkable man with some extraordinary talents and uh, one very well worth uh, devoting a session such as this to celebrating. I think that's been very, very well worthwhile. So I think now um, we have some time to and uh, five o'clock is the next element in our agenda. So thank you very much everybody.